Go. Good afternoon. Uh, the last of the tests that we're going to be discussing is sometimes called the counterexample test for invalidity, or I sometimes just uh, <clears throat> like to talk about this test as one of substitution. The reason I like to call it that is because what we're literally going to do is substitute content for our P's and Q's. You can call it the counterexample test, or you can call it the substitution test. But this is one important thing to keep in mind about this. This is a test that can really only discover invalidity for certain. You cannot use it to test for validity. At best, this test could be used as an inductive test for validity. Because if you use the substitution test on the same syllogism a whole bunch of times, and true premises keep shooting out true conclusions, you're making what I would call a relatively strong inductive case that the syllogism is valid. But remember, when it comes to induction, you cannot have certainty. You can only have greater or lesser degrees of probability. So if it passes the substitution test a number of times, you could be said to be making a strong inductive argument for its being valid. Now, why does the counterexample uh, method work? Recall the definition of validity. Validity means that if an argu a deductive argument's uh, <clears throat> premises are true, that the conclusion will be true also. Or as I like to say, if the premises are true, the conclusion will follow by necessity. That is, is necessarily true. Now, this cannot work if we put in false premises. Because remember, put false premises into a valid argument, all bets are off. And by the way, the other reason that it cannot test for validity is because from time to time, true premises sometimes spit out true conclusions, even in invalid structures. Sometimes, by happenstance, it occurs. Not often, but sometimes it does. This is why this cannot be used as a test for validity, but it can be used as a test for invalidity. If true premises are put in and a false premise is spit out, you only need one case to show that it's invalid. So, let's go back to an example of the counterexample test. We're going to need a syllogism. All P or R. All Q are R. Therefore, all Q are P. Well, folks, you already know that this one's invalid because we have an undistributed middle term here. But for sake of demonstrating this test, what we do is we, we plug in content for P, Q, and R that make our premises true, and then we look at our conclusion. If it spits out a false conclusion, we know that the syllogism is invalid. Now, what might we do here? Ah, our good friends, Wallabies. All wallabies are marsupials. Turns out that we've made premise one true that way. Now we have to make premise two also true. All marsupials are, what can we make them? All marsupials are mammals. mammals. Therefore, all marsupials are 
wild beasts. Guess what? That's false. Two true premises, false conclusion. Invalid by counterexample test. Now we knew what the outcome of this one should have been ahead of time. So perhaps we'll want to try another one just, just to make sure that we're steady with this. Maybe we should go a little more adventurous. Bring in some particular premises, perhaps. Let's try all P or Q. Some P are not R. Therefore, some R are not Q. Now, if we remember how to find our mood and our figure, our mood is A, O, and our conclusion's an O, and subject and subject is our middle term. This is an A003 syllogism. Now, to use the counterexample method, we substitute in content that make the premises true. So we might want to do something like, should we stick with wallabies? Nah, that can't hurt. All wallabies are marsupials. Some wallabies are not white, or we could say white things. Therefore, some white things are not marsupials. Well, guess what? This one's true. We put in true premises, true conclusion. But does this prove that it's valid? No, this test only works for invalidity. So what we're going to do is try it again. What else could we substitute in for P, Q, and R? All, oh, go ahead. Lion, feline, and animal. Lion? All lions are... Feline. I like that. Some felines are not, or rather, some lions are not mammals. We couldn't technically use this one because our first premise would be true and our second premise would be false. We've got to make our premises true in this case. Any other ideas? All all beers or all beers are things that contain water. And you know it's almost all water, right? You can't dehydrate on it, as they say. <laughs> there you go. Uh, now what can we make R? Some beer are not yellow things. You, know, you have your stouts and your quarters, they're not yellow. Therefore, some yellow things are not things that contain water. Sounds pretty inconclusive. Because remember, we want to find things that are definitively, definitively true, and this one's not. By the way, you already knew that this one was invalid. We have a distributed term in the conclusion. 
and it's undistributed up here. And it's undistributed up here. I hope I illustrated something useful here. This counterexample method is not a very easy method to use. It sounds the easiest, but it's one where your results are oftentimes hit and or miss, and it's also pretty difficult to use unless you find categories of things that are very easy to relate to one another. The last one I did with the uh, AE or the EAE syllogism actually worked out very easily because the relationships were easily discernible. In some cases, it's very difficult to make one up where the categories are easily discernible. I'm not saying this in order to dispel you from ever using this method, but I am attempting to reiterate the fact that you cannot prove validity with this method. You can only establish invalidity. The rules method and the Venn diagram methods are foolproof, provided that you're using them properly. Cheers. <laughs>